Hello, it's Seb, and this is the as yet unnamed latest inhabitant of my bookshelves. Um, I'm looking forward to coming up. I was thinking of like a kind of rabbity name, like something from Watership Down, but Watership Down has got this sort of epic feel, and like Fiverr is the like the character that I'd, like springs to mind, and he's like a really nervous rabbit, so it doesn't really fit. I think um, this rabbit I saw in a shop called Shoppers Drug. Um, which is a Canadian thing, I think, or I don't know if it's American as well, but it's like a cross between a pharmacy and a, a supermarket. And they had these Easter, uh, I was going for Easter eggs and I saw in the like kind of uh, stuffed toys section, they had some rabbits on the side, which were of much better quality, um, but like a bit cheaper than the normal uh, toys. And this one particularly caught my eye. It was kind of looking down from the top shelf and like one of its eyes looks like it's kind of going down a bit. So it's like giving you a bit of a hmm or it's, I don't know, it's got a great expression. Um, it's incredibly soft. They're all in different positions. Some of them were like kind of looking over their shoulder and this is the only one that was just like sitting down and chilling. But like its ears also stick up a little bit. So this, this one of them had like really floppy ears, but this one has got like nice kind of, well, they're they're long, but they, they, they go back as well if you, if you stroke them. Um, but yeah, he was there, or she was there. I haven't thought of gender either yet. But um, I decided, no, I'm not gonna spend, like, I don't know how much it was, like 13 or $15, even though it's really nice. It's like, well, we'll see, I'll, I'll think about it, you know, like maybe it'll still be there uh, in a few days. And uh, I was only going there for the chocolate anyways, but like I remembered the rabbit. And then after Easter, I went back to get some discount eggs, um, as you do, and um, all the rabbits were gone. The Easter section had been cleared out. Um, but I checked in the, like this was on the top shelf, right? Like I had to really reach it, like kind of like and put my arm back as far as it would go amongst the normal toys that were there. And just this rabbit remained of the kind of the special fancily made really, really soft and kind of feels like an actual rabbit rabbits. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a discount, it was only $5. So I felt like that was fate. Um, and so yeah, now the rabbit uh, lives here. I think they're gonna go there, probably. Has a little kind of loopy whisker, which I'm thinking I'm gonna cut um, or, or see if I can extract or something. But I really, uh, I'm happy with this, this new addition. Uh, to the to the family here, this by the way is supposed to be a uh, seagull, um, Kamomechan, uh, although it looks a lot like a duck. It's actually a light. I don't know if it goes on anymore, but no, I think the batteries need to be done. And this I got, um, this is a tiny little frog made of a special Peruvian rock. <laughs> this is what it said on the, on the label, which probably brings joy or something. He's giving you a big frown there. I don't know if you can see that. Um, oh, the books are escaping and squashing the seagull. But yeah, uh, this this frog um, I found in a place called Canyon Park, Lynn, Lynn Canyon Park. I'll put some uh, footage there if, if I can find any, uh, which is a really nice place. And they had like a gift shop, which had really reasonably priced kind of touristy things, including that frog. And the frog is like a mystical Peruvian frog. And I consider myself mystical and Peruvian. So I felt like it was it was a good match and a nice little memento. Um, and somebody else to, to live on the shelves with all the nice books. Um, and getting to the books themselves, I'll update you on the Weasel Saga. There used to be two of these, and I was thinking there were going to be three, but in the end it uh, turned out to be one, uh, because I, uh, if you watched the previous video, you'll know that I got this book based on the cover. I normally don't buy books. I got this one for Christmas. Uh, I didn't arrive at Christmas, but like, I, I, want, I like the cover. The cover is, it was dirty. You can kind of see there. It's got like what's possibly mold or something on it. I don't know. It's, it's not nice. But um, twice that happened from the same shop, uh, Blackwell's in the UK. And then it, I, was, I asked them, I sent an email saying, look, could you please send it again and make sure that it's got a nice cover or just refund the entire book? And they decided to go for the easy route and refunded it. Um, but then my good friend Laura saw that video that I posted about it and she asked if uh, like one of the weasels wanted to find a new home and it did so it's gone to stay with her. So this is the one that I have left and Laura and I are gonna bloody read um, the weasel, our, our respective weasels in um, maybe a week or two. We're both reading a lot of things at the moment. I'm reading uh, for poetry, The Shield of Achilles, doesn't have a, doesn't have a cover really, it just says The Shield of Achilles on the side, um, by W.H. Auden, because I like the little things I've read of him, but I've never properly read him, and I'm a sucker for a Greek myth and a title. 
uh, history and getting through Flowers in Schult, Schult? <laughs> Flowers in Schult, Flowers in Salt by uh, Sharon L. Sievers. There's lots of S's going on over there. So, um, and that's about uh, the beginning of uh, the feminist movement in Meiji era Japan. Then I've been, oh yeah, I read a little bit of uh, Tsushima Yuko's uh, Woman Running in the Mountains, which I'm really enjoying so far. Um, like kind of mystical, transcendental and pregnancy and like kind of daily life in Japan in the 70s and it's good. Then I've been going through like this fantasy thing where I watched um, the Lord of the Rings movies, like all three of them, like not in a row, but like, in, you know, in the, in the same space of time, uh, like in order, which I hadn't done since like, well, for a really long time, maybe like 10 years or something. Um, and that was nice. And, but it wasn't the thing that sparked it, but um, it got me thinking about fantasy and wondering like what came before Lord of the Rings? Because it feels so like everything is derivative. Of Lord of the Rings in a way and that Lord of the Rings sort of started like uh, the fantasy genre and I just thought I'm not knowledgeable enough like to say that so what actually came earlier than Lord of the Rings so I did a little Wikipedia and I found this one The Princess and the Goblin which I had heard about without realizing it was quite so old and I think I saw an animated film of it when I was a child which kind of scared me and left some images in my in my subconscious which come back from time to time so I thought yeah I'll give it a try um, I've, I've read so far 50 pages and I'm this far in. It's got a really nice cover. Um, I really like this Puffin classic cover um, where you can see the, the goblins underground and some people above ground. It looks like kind of the, what's her name, Lottie Reinhardt, I think, movies where she did shadow puppets of fantasy stories. It kind of gives me that vibe, um, especially with the color design and everything. But um, but yeah, it's uh, actually really good so far. One goblin has appeared. It like crawled up a rock like a spider, which was very scary and nice. Then I'm actually getting back into Babel. This is one that I've been reading for ages, for months and months. And it's one that like is one of those weird books where I can put it aside for like a month or return to the library for a month more like. And then when it comes back, read another chapter of it and not feel like I've missed out on much, which is kind of sometimes a good thing, obviously, because I can just get straight back into the world. Um, and other times I kind of feel like, oh yeah, the story doesn't happen that much in this. It's more about vibes and I'm sure that's very intentional. It's about uh, being a university student and um, the, the writer R.F. Kuang really captures that really well, I think, being like 18, going to 20 and making friends in a university. Um, it's, and there's magic. It's a world where if you're a translator, you can use magic basically. Uh, using the the mineral silver, you like the power of translation creates magic. You kind of summon things. It's it's kind of complicated, but it's good. It's also something that's not complicated to the extent that leaving it for a, for like a long period of time makes me forget how the world works or anything like that. And the t the way that time moves, time is moving like oh now they're in their first year, now it's the summer, and now they're in their second year. So it does feel like time goes kind of quickly. So reading the book slowly actually works quite well, but. That said, I want to, I'm going to squash the sleep for here. I want to um, finish it because I've been reading it for a while now and um, I'm kind of ready to get that under my belt, I think. So I think I am actually going to finish it soonish. Touch wood. I don't know if that will actually happen, but you know, I'll, I'm aiming in that direction this time. And there's this one, which I'll put here, which is called Delicious in Dungeon by uh, Ryoko Kui. Um, in Japanese, it's called Dungeon Meshi, which is just dungeon food, which I think is a better title <laughs> in both languages. But um, yeah, anyway, Delicious in Dungeon sounds like a kind of a bad translation anyways, and, and it is, but like, it's, it's kind of nice, it's got the alliteration. Um, but the reason I, I haven't started reading this, I've ordered it from my library. I was really happy to find that my local library uh, had this. I started watching the anime because my partner was watching the anime a few months ago and was like really into it, just always laughing, like with her headphones in and really obviously enjoying herself. So I wanted to find out what all the fuss was about. So we started watching it together. It's about, it's like a high fantasy thing. Um, with like elves and orcs and goblins and dragons and stuff and they go into a dungeon and the aim ostensibly is to save uh, one of the character's sisters from a dragon but you, you kind of quickly realize that his, his real aim or the thing that he's really passionate about is trying to survive 
on just eating uh, like what they can find in the dungeon. So the monsters that they usually have to kill, um, like it's really Dungeons and Dragons. Now so you go to a different floor, you kill some monsters, you get a key, you go to the next one. So it's obviously based in that kind of game-like world. But the kind of the point of it is that it's it's basically there's a, a subgenre of fiction in Japan, like food fiction, which is like the the story is just the plot is there so that you can look at food and think about food and think doesn't that look nice and learn how to make different foods and like look at pictures of food basically uh, it's a very asian thing i think um and it's not anything that i would find appealing normally actually i never really liked or got these things the food things and high fantasy like you know elves and wizards and stuff is also something that you know i i read some when i was a, a young kid and like lord of the rings and Discworld, and i liked them but it's not something that i've been like kind of drawn to after becoming an adult um, not like I would say no to anything necessarily, it's just not something that I find appealing normally. Um, and yet, this book puts the two of them together and somehow it works so well. I don't know why exactly yet. I think it's just because the, the combination is weird and so the weirdness makes you kind of interested in like how things are going to go, I guess. Um, the story goes on at a really good pace, the characters are really warm, it's very comfortable. The sort of the passion that some of the characters have, especially the main one, for that the ecosystem of the dungeon shows that the writer has obviously thought a lot about monsters in the dungeon and like how do they live, how do they reproduce, like what could you eat, what could you not eat. Um, and it's like kind of taking something which is obviously kind of silly and meant to be functional, you know, like oh there's the evil monster that you fight to get to the next place and thinking of it like in a more biological way I suppose like if this existed how would it actually work it's like a really fun chill adventure with passion about ecosystems I'm just really enjoying the anime right now and I can't wait to start reading the manga what I finished recently was um, The Alcestis by Euripides um, it's a it was technically a Greek tragedy although it's not what we would think of as tragic really um, it's uh, about a woman who takes her husband's death like the husband is able to is supposed fated to die but Apollo loves the husband and so like kind of wrangles a deal where the husband can stay living as long as until he reaches his natural uh, old age uh, death. Um, but he needs to pass on his death to somebody else and they need to accept it. So he passes it on, tries to give it to his parents and they say no, um, nobody wants to die in his place except for his dutiful wife Alcestis. So she decides to do that. Um, and then the story is kind of what happens when she dies and what happens next and Heracles comes as a guest and it's kind of funny it's kind of a comedy in some places and a tragedy in others it's like got this bittersweet feeling which is uh, kind of unique I think but yeah I actually read this back uh, well earlier this year when I went to this uh, place called Yellowknife I read the version translated by Ted Hughes um, and it was a really lovely magical experience. There was snow, it was like kind of minus 40 degrees and, um, and I had this, this book about like kind of death and life and like lots of abstraction stuff and beautiful poetic language. And that I made a nice vlog of it for you, which my computer ate. So unfortunately I hadn't talked about it really. But the thing about that one was while it was a really good experience, like I really wanted to know which bits were Euripides and which bits were Ted Hughes because some parts felt to me like the Euripides, the playwright who I really love and I've read a lot of plays by him now and the other parts felt more like Ted Hughes which is the British poet who I like quite a lot um, and yeah some bits just felt, felt very uh, 20th century British poet rather than you know like uh, ancient Greece <laughs> um, so like I wanted to like know which, which bit was what for example I remember specifically that there were some scenes where there were lots of characters on the stage um, and in the Greek tragedies, as far as I remember, like you can only have three actors, I think, at one go, plus the chorus. So having more than four, like, having like four characters in one scene just doesn't feel like a Greek tragedy to me at this point. Anyway, I really wanted to read a more kind of standard translation. And I found this in the local library. Um, it was on the shelf and it had Alcestis. And not only did it have Alcestis, it had it translated by Richmond Lattimore, who is the guy who translated the Iliad, one of the versions of the, one of the many translations of the Iliad, but the one that was assigned to me when I was a university student. So my first kind of entry into reading ancient literature, probably, at least ancient Greek mythology literature. So obviously a big deal for me. And I hadn't read anything translated by that guy since. So it just felt like everything came together. So Heracles appears and Heracles gets drunk. 
um, and that's in the Ted Hughes bit really funny um, because he starts like getting everybody to uh, he starts getting like the servants to act out his adventures and the, the labors of Hercules so he's saying for example okay so you be the boar I'm gonna show you how I kill the boar right and then he says okay okay no you're doing it all wrong I'll be the boar you be Hercules and the servants are obviously unhappy because they're a house of mourning but they're forced to do these silly games um, and he's having a great time and it was yeah it was really funny but as the sort of wildness goes on it becomes a weird hallucinatory kind of romp where through his drunkenness he starts seeing the future and he sees Prometheus and he sees himself you know kind of releasing Prometheus so that's a different Greek tragedy uh, by Aeschylus where Heracles releases Prometheus from his his imprisonment and his torture of having the, the eagle come and eat his liver every day um, also torture for the eagle you might think but anyway all that's in there and I thought this this feels really modern like the way that it's kind of becoming dreamlike um, and strange and so I expected Ted Hughes to kind of stretch things a bit and like try to maybe mind what was there to get something a little bit more mystical um, and uh, in the end uh, that whole scene was gone like that Heracles does get drunk um, but it, then he sobers up real fast so I was so surprised that like Ted Hughes just inserted the whole middle section of, of his version of Alcestis which was the best part of it so in a way this was actually kind of disappointing <laughs> Because I really liked it, but I couldn't help reading it in the shadow of the Ted Hughes version. So I need to let it sit with me for a bit. Another thing I didn't like about the Ted Hughes version is that he has God appear. He has a character called God, right? Instead of like Zeus or one of the gods or something. Just God uh, has a bit of a role in it. So it does have a sort of Christian uh, undertone. I'm not into that when it's, you know, going to other myths and cultures and things like that. We have that Jesus stuff in Narnia, right? And it's great in Narnia, but let's keep it in Narnia. We don't need it in the Greek myths. That's my hot take. Um, anyway, uh, I also finished The City in the City by China Mieville. That was uh, good, also like in some ways really great and sort of like nothing I'd read before, in other ways disappointing. It was basically like a police procedural detective story in a really kind of bog standard one at that with not a great plot but in an amazing, creative, imaginative setting, um, which is the city and the city, uh, two cities which are kind of coexisting in the same geographical space, but with different cultures and inhabitants who ignore the other city, right? So you have to kind of just imagine that it doesn't exist. And so it's like, it's a political situation, but it feels like fantasy because of how it's written. Um, and like, to the point that like, I remember I enjoyed reading a lot of the um, negative reviews of this on Storygraph because some people were like, they never explain the magic. They never explain why people can't see the other people. And for me, that was just fascinating that some people read this book feeling that it was a sort of, you know, magic fantasy rather than just a political one. Like, I mean, maybe some people go into the book with their sort of expectations or maybe younger readers as well who are more sort of in the fantasy sphere and maybe don't know so much about, I don't know, places like North Korea or, 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 or know about like East and West Berlin or places where, you know, like the kind of political order means that you have to see certain people or certain institutions as invisible. And um, I don't know, all that stuff was really great, but it was paired with this detective story. And the detective story was a good way to explore the two worlds because the murder sort of kind of means that you have to cross borders a lot um but it, it just at the end of the day the characters were boring the story i didn't think was very interesting it was all the world that was doing all the work right all the the world building um was was the the reason to read the book i'm still glad i read it but um yeah it's, it was interesting to me like it seemed like a really good idea matching these two story elements together and it's not that they didn't gel smoothly it's just that one was good and one wasn't for me so i mean yeah unlike totally unlike um dungeon meshi which i mentioned before where the two elements are things which i'm not particularly interested in but by coming together they create a new thing which that like kind of third category which i haven't been able to kind of categorize yet or think of how to explain it yet um but like yeah it's a weird comparison to make i know Let, let's forget about that but anyway those are the things i've been reading lately let me know if you have any thoughts about them or what you've been reading lately and let's chat about it down in the comments uh see you in the next video bye i wish i could communicate to you how soft this rabbit is